please hit record. Thank you. So we know more and we definitely know more than we knew 2000 years ago. And we definitely know more than we knew 4,000 years ago when Moses walked the earth, right? So we know that we're always coming into new dimensions of understanding what mental health looks like and where God would have us to be in this hour. The number one default of really religious people is always going to be the devil. So you have to, at, at some point, I want us to really try to grab hold of that. The devil is the scapegoat for super spiritual people. It is always the case. But it, it's sad because the truth is a lot of things happen because we're in this fallen world. And because the world is fallen and because the world is broken, I will tell you that there will be sickness, there will be disease, there will be criminal activity, there will be all kinds of religion because the world is broken. But for us, for the people of God, we've been made complete in Christ. And I believe that completeness is something we are still struggling to understand. And as long as we don't believe that Christ fulfilled his mission, we're going to be in trouble. So I'm setting this up with just that statement because there are a lot of people that are determined for the devil to have his day. They are determined the devil will have his due, but they're not determined to give God his victory. They're not determined to give God his preeminence. They're not determined to give Christ his scepter of, of no longer holding the scepter of the lawgiver, but holding the scepter of grace. And so because of that, many of us have made Jesus a liar. We made him um, um, lower than the devil. But the bottom line is Jesus and the devil are not brothers. They do not have equal power. They do not have equal dominion. They do not have the same type of ability. We know that um, um, the, the evil one is the God of this world, but we also know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus, that Jesus, that Jesus took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. We know that Jesus is all powerful. We know that we have been given delegated authority. So one of the things that I have asked you guys to do over the course of, of these next few months is really go through those, those um, promises, those guarantees. And I hope that we're doing that because I can't get away from them. But I'm gonna talk to you today about mental health and I, I wanted to make that statement beforehand because I believe it needs to be said. I'm very wary of people who have influence and the first thing they go to is the demonic realm. That's the first place. Instead of casting all of our cares on Jesus, you know, who cares for us, they immediately default to what's wrong with you, to what door did you open. Those things are relevant, but we have to put them in context to what the Lord has accomplished. So I hope that we can be on, a, on the same page today. I hope that we can be teachable. I hope that we can deal with mindsets. Well, I know it's the devil. And I, we, we come against that right now in the name of Jesus. And may we turn our conversation to, I know the Lord is at work in what oppresses me. I know the Lord is at work in what I'm going through. I know God has won this situation for me. If we can just change our language, we will put on the mind of Christ more. We will walk deeper into that place. Can you just flip your language? Can you just flip it? So we've been talking about healing. And if you go back and you listen to the last few teachings we've had, you know that we're still talking about the same thing. We're still talking about these same 
issues and we're just moving into mental health right now because mental health is a family issue. It's a family matter. How do I know? Well, I grew up with a mother that was fully schizophrenic. And I'm not sharing that to just tell my story. I try not to talk about things unless it's necessary. But I want you to know I grew up with a mother who painted crosses on windows, who put buckets of water in front of our bedroom doors and would make us wake up in the morning to wash our sins away. I grew up with the mother who, who would walk around street all through town known for wearing these big crosses and holding up the crosses, warding off devils and demons. I grew up with the mother who, who would, would um, anoint every, every, every door in the house for evil spirits. And she really believed all of this. And I remember times when she would make me bathe two or three times a day because she felt that I was unclean. So we go through all kinds of things and she would just see devils and see spirits everywhere. That, and she swore she had a veil over her eyes and that the spiritual realm was speaking to her. And here we are in church every single day, except for, except for Thursday. And so it was crazy growing up like that. And so I'm just sharing this with you because this was my life every day of my life until I moved into the foster care system. You know, so, so there are all kinds of mental health experiences that people have. And I know that my mother actually tapped into the demonic realm, but did it start out that way? No, it was a real trauma. And that trauma went untreated. And untreated mental illness can take away your whole identity and your whole personality. But on the flip side of this, I want to also share with you that mental illness is not just um, schizophrenic, it's not just psychosis. Is not just um, 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 depression. It's not just having a suicidal stronghold. Mental health also deals with people, listen to me, that are born simple. I'm going to say that again, that are born simple. They may have an intellectual disability. That's an issue of mental health. They may have a specific chromosomal diagnosis. That is mental health. So it's not just dealing with suicide, dealing with depression, dealing with diagnoses. It's also chromosomal. It's also, listen, there are people who, who um, have special diets. And if they don't get the right vitamins into their system, they will battle mental health. So I want us to understand if you're not getting all of the vitamins you need is going to not only affect your physical body, if you're not getting enough electrolytes, you're going to have cramping all in your body. You know, you're, you're going to be disoriented. You're going, you're going to have all of these things happening on the inside of you. And we understand that. So is it the devil's fault that you don't have the electrolytes that you need in your body? or that you decided you were gonna eat only sweet stuff, so now you're getting sick left and right. Listen, I want us to kind of think about this for a minute because sometimes when it comes to mental health, we have this tunnel vision. We have this tunnel vision that is all coming from one place. And the truth of the matter is it can come from trauma, it can come from your physical outlook. It can be chromosomal. It can, there are so many ways to enter into this conversation about mental health. And before we start, I just wanted to share those things with you before we get into the part, the single little part we're going to talk about today so that we can understand that before we start crying devil and crying oppression and crying, we need to go back and do some checklist stuff. Am I eating right? 
Am I, is, am I crossing a season of life where my body is being depleted of certain hormones? I'm not 15 anymore. I am 60 now. What do I need to do? We need to start looking at those things. Just looking at those things. There has to be this practical place because these amazing bodies that we have can be time bombs. They can be capsules of toxicity that will affect our mental health. I also want to say that, um, you know, we, we, in addition to the demon default, that's what I like to call it. We default to the devil when we don't want to face our trouble, when we don't want to face our situation. There's always a hunt for open doors. We love going back into the past and digging up stuff. And, you know, people will spend a thousand hours of their lives in their past and give their present zero accountability. They're not making any strides in the right now to move forward. They just keep going back and going back and going back. And there's nothing in place to push them forward. I just wanna say that um, I think we can agree on this. I think we can agree on, on some things that we're sharing this morning. And I want to know that we're on the same page as we move forward, that you are doing your very best to try to follow along as I set this up and put us into a place of understanding and insight. You know, people get really mad at you when you don't talk about the devil. They get mad with you because that's their God. You know, the God, their God is really not Jesus. It's the demonic realm. They get upset. They feel like you don't know what you're talking about. They feel like you're missing something. They feel like you don't get it. When the truth is, all you're saying is, I want to think like Jesus. I want the mind of Christ living in me. And Jesus was not worrying about his defeated enemy. He was not, is not, never will be again worrying about his defeated enemy. That's a truth that we have to establish somewhere on the inside of us that we are really going to move forward. So this is going to be one of those difficult conversations, especially if people are among the demon hunters of this day, the devil hunters, the Jezebel killers. You know, that's all they can see. And I'm not trying to be funny. I am so serious. We have serious problems. The witch hunts of 2021. You know, we are really in that place. <laughs> we really are. And we look at the day of the Vikings. We look at, you know, the Norse, the Norse people. We look at how, how they were treated when um, Christianity was introduced. We look at the early days of the establishment of the Catholic church and it's the same kind of stuff happening today. What in the world does this have to do with mental illness? Because it has to do with our perception. It has to do with our perception. And we've had some tremendous teachings on perception. I think one of the most profound teachings is inside the Scribal Conservatory Arts and Worship Center's page where um, Dr. K taught on perception, which was, uh, oh, that teaching, it, it changed me forever. And so I'm gonna try to find that teaching because it is on that page and post it because we need that teaching. We need that teaching. Now, many people struggle inherent, inherently with healing mental health because they cannot free themselves of legalism. Now, I want to share this because I firmly believe that for the conservatory, and I'm speaking to the conservatory this morning, I believe it's a message we need and I believe it's a message we need to hear. I'm not trying to deal with the whole world. This is not about all Christians. What I'm teaching you this morning is a piece of what I believe the problem is in our struggle and in our healing. And I believe that this is a foundation for our ability to heal 
mentally and, and in our mental health, specifically if we can just understand that one of the greatest battles we have is with legalism. If we can let go of legalism, we can begin to release some of the stronghold that holds us back from healing in our mind, in our mind. So just follow with me with this. I'm going to read this to you. And um, I just wrote that, the, that legalism is understood as the direct or indirect attachment of behaviors, disciplines, and practices of belief that we believe define how we achieve right standing with God. This is huge. So if your behavior, your disciplines, your practices, how you think, all of that affects how you believe you can be healed. It affects how you believe you can be healed. And they unhealthily tie us to false beliefs about what is not only happening in us and around us, but through us. Last week, I talked to you about um, how important it was to, to well, in last week and the week before, and probably the week before that, we talked about how important it is to know what we see or how we view sin. Because if we see sin as an act versus missing the mark, if we see God's calling out of sin as you are bad versus this is what is separating you from me, it will affect everything you believe about your own healing. Are you all with me on that part? I want you to see how this theme song plays out in our lives. If you believe that on one side of the coin, if you believe everything is an abomination, if you have that, that's, that's just unclean. And it's true it's unclean. It's true that it's evil. It's true that it's bad. But if your whole world is shaped around, uh, around, oh my God, they're doing that. So they're evil. They're bad. They're nasty. They're unredeemable. Oh my God, they're going straight to hell. If that is how you see everything related to sin, then you're going to miss the highway of grace because the reason why God points out sin is because, oh my God, my people are perishing. What they're doing is separating them from me more. The more they do this, the more they practice this, the farther they get pulling themselves away from my heart. This is why I point out sin. It's two different things. Legalism put us in the hate side where hate becomes, I hate people. These people are unredeemable. These people are nasty. These people are evil versus, oh my God, I see who I created on the grace side and they are not loving me like I have ordained for them too. They are not. So we want to be on the side of grace. And I, I want to explain grace like this because most people, when they hear you talk about grace, they hear you talking about, um, they think you're, you're, you're gentle towards sin. They think that you're too loving. So because you show love, that means that you're ignoring their sin state. No, grace is this. Christ died for us, though we were yet sinners. That's what he's saying. He died for us, even though we were yet sinners. The perception of mental health right now is high. I mean, it's always been high. We started having a rash of pastors killing themselves seven, eight years ago. I think the first time it became consecutive was around 2015. We just saw one pastor after another, mostly mega pastors and leaders, just committing suicide, left and right, left and right, left and right. And we were getting prophecies about there's a, something demonic going on. You know, there's this. And yes, there's something demonic going on. But the question in the midst of that, because it's not God's will that people kill themselves, take their own lives. He's not looking for us to do that. But there are some underlining things that we must consider that get, gets people to a point where they do that, especially 
in the faith, especially in the faith. Yes, we're talking about mental illness. illness. So if we see mental health only from the demonic realm, then we will only be able to see legalistic views surrounding how to combat it. If we're able to see mental health holistically, if we're able to see it from a perspective of grace, then we will see more than one avenue to deal with that issue in our lives. Oh my goodness, we won't see ourselves from that condemning place that often comes in the face of legalism. I want to walk you through something, um, uh, just a, a definition of mental health that we're going to use before I go into the scripture. But I just wanted to give you this part of the foundation so that you'll know um, where we're heading. I always say to people, you know, when I'm talking about mental health, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a credentialed pastoral counselor, but I want to let you know that when it comes to mental health, your credentials don't matter because in that sense of the word, right now in your own healing, because we all have to face our healing process when we hit those moments in our lives, right? I just want to make sure that, that you're on the same track <laughs> as I am. We love those credentials, but we also know that many of the people who have those credentials have not even resolved their own struggles. So we want to make sure that we all have the right to talk about mental health because we're all people who have those battles. Well, I don't deal with mental health. Well, if you have grieved for someone you lost, you've dealt with mental health. If you have been stressed and overwhelmed by a situation, you've dealt with mental health. If you struggle to forgive and you've held on to offense, you've dealt with mental health. If you have a loved one who has autism or Asperger's, you've dealt with mental health. If you have a loved one that has Alzheimer's or that's suffering from dementia, you've dealt with mental health. So you cannot say mental health does not affect me because mental health affects everyone. I mean, on a very basic level, we're dealing with the mental health of two and three-year-olds when we're teaching them how to handle their, their, their tantrums and how to share. <laughs> I mean, that's just basic. Everyone deals with mental health, with mental health. So in our faith, the, the ministry of reconciliation is always at the forefront. So if you are a leader in the faith and you're qualified by God, you're qualified to talk about mental health. We live in a time when people make everything a ministry. You know, I don't make my, my mom struggle a ministry. Yeah, you know, I'm not saying people aren't called to address issues, but my ministry is reconciliation. If you are called to any form of ministry, your ministry is reconciliation. Can you agree? Can you agree? God never said, Teresa, I did bestow upon you a ministry of mental health. No, he gave us a ministry of reconciliation in whatever capacity we are sent. Oh my gosh. That goes for a whole lot of things, but I'm just going to leave that right there because most of us won't even be able to understand that because of the commercialization of ministry today. People have to be the guru of this or the guru of that. I'm called to reconcile. If you really watch the scribal ministry, we're reconciling scribes to their purpose. We're immersing them in the reality of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. We're bringing people back to their reconciled places. Every ministry that is a ministry ordained by God 
will have reconciliation at the center, including anything addressing mental health. We may be anointed in grace to help people heal in their mental capacity, but everything is about reconciliation. <laughs> so we just need to get back on the railroad track we're supposed to be on. So when we look at mental health, I want us to understand that mental health is defined as our personal, intimate state of being as it relates to our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. I'm gonna say that again. Mental health is our personal, intimate state of being as it relates to our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. And get this, it affects and impacts our life state in its entirety. How can I say that? Your mental health affects your ability to interact relationally with one another. It does. Your mental health affects how you relate to the stranger, to your husband, to your children, to grandma, to, to the people at the church, to the people in the grocery store, the people on the street you passing by. Your mental health affects how you relate to other people. Your mental health affects how you engage in everyday life. Do you rock on a chair all day? and just judge people from the street. I mean, listen, you're, how do you engage in everyday life? Are you productive or non-productive? How your mental health determines how you engage in everyday life. It does. If you just throw your life away and, and addiction has a hold of you, that's a mental health issue. Right? I'm just, I'm, I'm just throwing that out there so we know it's relational. Our ability to participate productively or unproductively in society and even to sustain ourselves is a part of our mental health. Our decision-making capacities reveal our mental health. Our, our, our decision-making capacities reveal our mental health. Our decision-making capacities reveal our mental health. Can't say that again. Our ability or inability to handle stressful situations reveal our mental health. You cannot disguise your health. And listen, don't, don't, don't say that because a person has an inability to handle stressful situations that they got mental illness. Listen, there are people that never have problems. They're too prideful to have problems. They want you to think they always together. That's a dangerous mental health issue as well. I, I just I just want you to kind of see this. You know, the people who never cry, they, they, ne they, they just got it together. That can only sustain you from so long. I'm just, I'm just telling you, we, we need to really, really, really look at some of this stuff. And it can still be trauma. It can be trauma that got them living life as a statue. It can be trauma. Oh, I got to be strong for everybody. It's a mental health issue. Our quality of life, listen to this, physical and spiritually can determine our mental health. How dangerous it is to be so spiritually minded that there is no practicality in anywhere in your life. It's all about what's happening and that's happening magically. Magic everywhere, magic, magic found my keys. I'm, I'm, I'm just throwing this out here. The leaf fell off the tree. There's magic in that. It's not, when the truth is, it's just the changing of seasons. 
or if somebody hit a rock or a gust of wind blew and the leaf fell. Listen, mental health is everywhere. Mental health is everything from birth to age, whatever. We are always in this place of mental health and having to deal with ourselves. I mentioned to you before, mental health can result from birth defects. Chromosomal issues resulting in intellectual disability, different um, types of, of behaviors on the autism spectrum, brain injury, mental health can come in all kinds of ways. Because of that, we cannot keep saying everything is the devil. If you hit your head on a pole and have to have a percentage of your brain removed and is not supernaturally regenerated through your prayer, then there is something else that must take place in that. There's some grace we need to give ourselves in the midst of life things that happen. If a person is an untreated diabetic, and we all know that diabetes through science and through the study of medicine is the number one link to dementia. We know that. So now is there a diabetes devil? Or is there a real issue of health that's tied to the physical body? So I know I've spent a lot of time on this. I promise you there are scriptures, but I want us to see Absolutely, menopause, changes in the body, practical things. Who I was at 15, I'm no longer at 51. And all of them affect mental health. Oh, oh my goodness. When I was sharing with you about my mother, my mother had a very traumatic childhood and her uh, mental illness was triggered by childbirth. And every time she gave birth to a child, she went deeper into her mental health crises. But in the church she was in, it was always, let's pray against the devil. Let's cast out the demons. Because back then, the understanding of certain types of triggers and mental health didn't exist. Absolutely, it was untreated postpartum that began to set the stage for a cascading wall of mental distress and disease, untreated. So, so yeah, what does this have to do with the Bible? Everything, everything, because I wanna move you from legalism to grace. And not just legalism to grace for other people, but grace for yourself. When we can understand that I am the way that I am, not, uh, not just because I have a devil, not just because something is wrong with me, not just because I'm cursed, not just because it's been passed down. From, if I can know that God is with me in whatever state that I am in, I will have the grace to heal. I will have the grace to walk through without condemnation. I will have the grace to stop these people from trying to cast devils out on me and making me feel more condemned than I did when I walked in the room. I will have the grace to say, I, God is with me even in this place that I am because I'm going to tell you, God was with the man that had legion on the inside of him. God saw that man. 
even in the midst of demonic oppression and set that man free without 50 hours of counseling. That was grace for him. Oh my goodness. And there is grace for you. Oh God, I'm just trying to make sure I'm going in the right direction with this because one of the main reasons why people struggle to heal from mental illness is because of mental health or mental illnesses is because they're ashamed. Shame, pride. We've created a climate in the body of Christ that tells leaders or tells people that something is real, that God is not with you if you have a mental crisis. I remember when my son was born and he was having all these problems. And some of you know, you know, um, some of the, they started off with one diagnosis. Since then he's had a thousand diagnoses. And now they just gave him one diagnosis. And, and, you know, and I'm like, okay, you know, whatever the diagnosis I need to get him the services and resources he needs, that's what I'm going with on paper. But God is with my son. <laughs> whatever state that we are in, God is with us. God is with us. You need to know that. I want to I wanna share something with you. We're going to take a look real quick at Isaiah 53. And we all know Isaiah 53. We know this is the Messianic passage that um, prophesies Jesus. Um, for those that are, are in the Christian faith and that believe in the Messianic prophecies, the revealing of Christ in the old covenant into the new and the connection by revelation that is made, um, I want you to, I want you to just see this because Jesus dealt with mental health. There are people who will tell you that there is nothing um, tangible about how to deal with mental health in the scriptures. I, I beg to differ. And I know you do too. I believe the whole Bible is about having the right mind to put on the mind of Christ, being stable in the things God calls you to do, changing your mindset, changing your thinking, transformation, metamorphosis. I believe reconciliation is all about your mental health. As a man thinketh, so is he. But even if you're not able to think right, even if you're in the midst of your struggle, we need to know by grace that God is still with you. And that is what I want you to know today as we walk through this. So I'm gonna try to go as fast as I can. Isaiah 53, four through 11. Um, this is one of our uh, Messianic passages and it's about Jesus. It's about prophesying his existence, his existence. And the scripture tells us, surely he took up our pain. Now I'm gonna go to the favorite one, the one we know the most. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. I'm reading this today, not from the perspective of what Christ, uh, what was accomplished through Christ, through Jesus Christ. I'm reading it because I want us to know that he, that Jesus went through grief. He went through sorrow. He was stricken. He was afflicted. He was smitten by God in a moment for our sakes. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He suffered. He suffered and it was, it took a toll on his mental health and we don't look at that that way, but I, when you go back and we're going to take a look at this, so I'm not going to go there ahead of time, but it says he was oppressed and he was afflicted. 
yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers and silence. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? That part right there. And who will declare his generation? You know, I look at that passage and, and no one, you know, the other passage of scripture says, yeah, who of his generation protested? There are so many people who see you going through, who see us going through, and they don't know how to respond. They don't know what to do. I want you to know that Jesus was in this situation. They didn't know how to help him overcome. But there they were walking alongside. We know who walked with him, Mary, the other Mary, his brother James. We know that we know they were in the shadows because sometimes when people are in a mental crisis and a mental battle, all you can do is be in the shadows while everybody else is mocking them, while everybody else is laughing. But look, if you read your word, you wouldn't be in that situation. If you went to church, you wouldn't be dealing with it. You know how, you know how people do. Listen, some of you know my testimony. I have been institutionalized more than once. I've been on medication. I've been a hopeless case in my adult life, not just my childhood. Listen. So don't think people don't understand just because they didn't build a ministry around their suffering. My ministry is built around immersion and it's built around life and reconciliation. So here we have this place where it says in verse nine, and they made his grave with the wicked. Hold that for a minute. People who have struggled emotionally and mentally are often put in the grave of the wicked. What did you do? What curse are you under? What sin are you in? Oh my gosh. What did you do? It's your fault because the Lord showed me that devil such and such and such and you need to cast it down. I, I, I'm just, and, and listen, as we hear these things, people's intentions are good, but what they're fueling in the mind of those battling mental health is shame, humiliation. Something's wrong with me. God is not with me. I have too many devils. Oh my goodness. I hope you all are hearing from a place of grace. I hope you're hearing from the perspective of grace. See, religion will be battling me right now by saying, but we need to deal with them devils. I never said we weren't going to deal with strongholds or the catastrophe that comes when we open up our lives to all kinds of addictions, which pornography can become. So it's not just that a person might be in a sin of pornography or drug addiction, opioids or street drug, it don't matter. What matters is that it has now become an addiction, which is now an issue of mental health. Oh my goodness. Just get right. Yes, it worked for you. You got saved on the spot. God took the taste out your mouth. <laughs> I mean, he took it from you. But that doesn't happen for everyone. Every person is different. Every person is different but legalism puts the sameness on everybody legalism 
puts everybody under the same hand, hammer. And it can only work that way. It can only be this. It can only be that. It can only be that. Oh my gosh. So now everybody got to try to get healed that way because somebody told them that that was the only way they could find their freedom. Oh my goodness. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. This is the Jesus part. This is his testimony, not ours. God is not pleased by our suffering. We are not sent to be the Christ. So I just want to make sure that little blue part is not misunderstood. Because we're not saying God caused this to come upon you. No, we're on the grace now. We're on the grace. God is doing things differently through Jesus. Through Jesus. I just wanted to throw, show you Jesus' suffering because we need to see it. We need to see. We know Jesus' journey. We know what he went through. But I love this, this right here. This is, um, let's see. This is Matthew 26. And we're looking at verse 36. And I guess we're going to look at, I think this is the new King James. I'm going to go through it real quick. I want you to see this. It says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and two sons of Zebedee along with him and began to, so and began to be sorrowful and troubled. Oh my goodness, this is Jesus. Jesus is now cast it down. He is troubled. He is hurting. Then he said to me, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Now Jesus is suicidal. Jesus is heavy. He said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. This is very important. Has your soul ever been troubled to the point of death? Mine has, both times I was put in the hospital was because I had tried to kill myself. Both times were suicide attempts, not just a nervous breakdown. My longest stint was eight weeks. Eight weeks in a room with someone assigned to my door 24 hours a day, so I would not attempt to kill myself. I want you to hear me. If you have not felt cast down to the point of death, then you, you probably wouldn't see this passage that way. But if you read the Messianic prophecy, Isaiah 53, if you follow the progression of this Gethsemane experience, you'll understand that this is exactly what Jesus was saying. Oh my God. Oh. Then he returned to his disciples and um, where was that? Okay, yeah. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he says, stay with me. Keep watch with me. I'm not feeling strong right now. I'm feeling so weak. I'm so broken. I just need you to stand with me. Going a little farther. In other words, here he is. He's pushing through. He's pushing through. He's pushing through. He fell. The spirit did not fall on him. He fell as if a man giving up. And all he could do was cry out, my father. If it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. And something happened between that fall and that last sentence. And he cried out, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus was able to get his breakthrough in that moment. There was grace for his breakthrough. 
There was grace for his journey. He was grace. Oh my God. Oh. And depending on which gospel you're reading, because you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, depending on which one of those, I won't go into the synoptics, but I just believe that everybody has a part of the story that stood out to them and that they remember. Well, we know Luke came on and he tried to do it comprehensively, but I want you to just see this. Verse 40, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleep, sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? We know how that was preached all through our lives, especially if you grew up in the Baptist church. You know how that was preached. I can never forget it. But it's one thing that I know for sure is this next sentence. He said, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Oh, 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 the Lord is saying, oh my God, you, you've got to be able to watch and pray because this soul will tempt you to take your own life. This soul will tempt you to give up. This soul will, your mental health will be at stake, but the spirit of God in you is willing. But the flesh that you have, is weak. This part changed me because I was able to understand God is not condemning me for my mental health crisis. Rather, he is there holding me up through it. Oh my God. Oh, he's holding you up when you throw yourself down. He's holding you up when you say, Father, take this crisis from me. Lord, I'm tired of going through it. He is there. The Bible says when I am weak, he is strong. When my mind is weak, it's not just flesh. Because when we learn this in the Baptist church, it's talking about they take it into temptation. And the temptation of the flesh, not the temptation of your mental health. This is about the mind. And Jesus was asking his friends, can you just stand with me? But like many of the people who love us today, when people don't know what to do when you like that, especially when you're a leader, ooh, the devil got her. The devil got that pastor. What kind of pastor he was if he went and killed himself? They're not understanding that Jesus understands our mental anguish. They're not understanding that he has made provision for us. They're not understanding that sometimes people slip through the cracks. Oh my goodness. Let's go. I want you to see Luke. Luke 22, 41 to 44. This is Luke, what Luke decided to publish. He said, Jesus withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them. He knelt down and he prayed. A different spin on it. But he said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. This passage says, an angel appeared from heaven to him and strengthened him. Doesn't mean that the Bible is contradicting itself. It means that people have different parts of the story. Maybe someone had a conversation with Luke that gave him a piece that someone else did not see. But listen to this, verse 44. This is where we find the agreement. And it says, and being in anguish, Jesus was mentally anguished and he prayed more earnestly. Jesus decided he was going to pray even more. He's, he's Jesus, the Christ. 
But if I just pray, Jesus almost slipped in the legalism. Thinking if I pray more, it's going to look. His anxiety was so high that his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. And this is a real medical condition, by the way. Just look it up. Look up sweating blood, medical condition. Brought on by extreme anxiety and extreme stress. Are you guys with me? Are you still walking with me? Because we are heading to a destination. We are heading to a destination. Most of us must be healed from viewing mental health issues from a legalistic perspective. Because if we're viewing it from a legalistic perspective, we'll always be looking for legalistic remedies to heal us. And we'll miss the fact that our mental health issues are not condemnation. It's not the devil after us for every single thing. It's a struggle that is common to man. It's a place where the Lord wants to meet you and there is grace for your healing. We can't be healed if we don't recognize that grace is for us and if we can't enter into the grace instead of condemnation. Because when we enter into condemnation, we hide. How do we hide? I don't want nobody to know I'm going through this. Well, when you attempt to kill yourself, everybody's going to know anyway. When your mind splits, everyone is going to know. When you're standing before the people God has sent to you, they're going to pick up things are not right. Why not be on the side of grace where love can cover you? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Look, 2241, I'm gonna read it from the King James Version. Just, just verse 43 and 44. Then the angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more honestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Oh my goodness. This is important because it shows us the depth of Jesus's agony. But this is the place of grace I want to bring you into right now. Hebrews 4 and 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Why is this important? Because your mental health issues are not sins before God. Having a mental issue does not mean you are sinning necessarily. If you're a drug addict, then your addiction has defaulted into a sin place. So not only should there be a place of repentance before the Lord, but sometimes we have to go back and repent to grandma who we stole from. We have to repent from sisters and brothers who we left our children with. I am one, my husband and I are people who have raised children due to addiction and drugs. Are you, I, I need you to hear grace right now. Your mental health struggle does not necessarily cause you to sin or put you in a place. Mental health is a, mental health issues is illness. If I broke my arm and my leg, everybody could understand that it's going to take me six weeks to heal up if I'm healthy, if I have a heart attack or if my blood pressure rises, 
They understand that that is a sickness. That is something that I have to get regulated. They understand that I might need stitches. I might need a rod in my leg if it's broke. But when it comes to mental health, we don't see it in the right light. We need to see it as a broken arm, a broken leg, a broken heart. There are places in our mental health in which we are irrational, in which we do things that cause us to be out of our mind. But if it's a mental health crisis and not willful cruelty, not willful, I had to forgive my mama for a whole lot of horrible things that happened when I was in that house with her. Because if you have lived your whole life with somebody who is mentally ill, you are not okay. Not only are you not okay at the hand of their abuse, but your mind is not okay. I had to get to a place in my life in which I understood I needed to be made whole. I had to stand at the pool of Bethesda for 35 years until I got a breakthrough. Then I had to go back and do penance in the, in the sense of asking people to forgive me for behavior that I had engaged in, for things that I had to go and forgive my mother because I had new eyes. I didn't see her as the devil anymore. I started seeing her as a broken woman who never was healed, who never was understood, who needed grace and there was no grace for her. I'm giving you these as examples. You have to give yourself an opportunity to understand that when you're dealing with grief, when you're dealing with, with a mental instability, when you're battling depression, when you're manically depressed, when you're suffering from bi bipolar diagnosis, when you're, you have to give yourself grace in your lucid moments to not only recognize that this is a real tangible thing that I'm facing, but that God is with me in every way possible, even if I am not healed in this moment before me right now. Jesus' life proves to us that we can go through something and keep achieving victory as we go through. I look at my grandson, my, my granddaughter, and I look at my um, son. And one of the most profound prophecies I ever received about my son one day when my family and I were going through, I was at my end. I was tired, I hadn't been able to get rest. We're dealing with this particular issue concerning him. It's a daily situation taking place. And I'm like, God, what is going on? I'm about to lose it. I'm cracking at the hinges. I'm at the fringes of jumping off a bridge somewhere. And I remember this, I remember, Lord, why? I just kept asking God, why was this happening to me and, and my children? Just being honest with you, because we go through that. Was I sinning when I said that? Absolutely not. I was lamenting before the Lord. I didn't make a decision. I didn't decide to leave him. I didn't withdraw and take another place and go to doing something else. I, that was me in my fight. You cannot be upset or uh, with yourself because of how you fight. God knew what was in my heart anyway. And we've talked about that. So I just had to verbalize it and bring it to the table. I don't wanna put that in my journal. I can't speak that. Well, you've already spoken it. The scripture tells us clearly that the Lord sees our thoughts. Why not write it down? It'll help you to put it to paper. It'll help you to speak it. But this is what got me. The Lord said to me, he said, 
through um, a prophetic word. He said, I am with your son. I'm with your granddaughter. I'm with your mother. I minister to them exactly where they are. Oh my God. God is ministering to the brokenhearted. He's ministering to those who have struggles we don't understand or can't comprehend. He's ministering to the simple. Oh my God. He's ministering to them. Ah, uh, he's drawing them. When you're in your worst moment, legalism will make you think that God has left you. If we can be healed and have that broken off of us, we will know that where darkness abounds, grace abounds much more. We will know that on the edge of that cliff, Jesus is right there with his hands open. Oh my goodness. Some of you who have been in places of grief have experienced God while you're in that grief in ways you have never experienced him were it not for the grief. Somebody need to say that's the truth. Because you know that's the truth. Oh my goodness. Let's look at this. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Everybody here right now loves God. And because you love God, and because that pursuit is authentic, and because you're moving toward him, even in that place of brokenness, even in that struggle in your mental health, he is making you righteous daily. We have to remember that. Legalism always has an alternative for why God can't be with you. <laughs> I'm telling you, legalistic people got a thousand reasons for why God can't possibly be with you in, your, in, in a mental health crisis. <laughs> But that's not what the Bible teaches. Oh my gosh. As you walk through your mental health crisis, the thing we have to guard against is pride. pride the pride of life will keep you hidden and suffering alone. I want you to hear this. First Peter five, I just, I just want you to hear this. Just listen. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing as God wants you to be not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Reading this for context. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Listen to this. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Now listen to this. What, why that next statement? Cast all your anxiety on him 
because he cares for you. Oh my goodness. Context is everything. Listen, elders, those who are leading, those who want to lead, you know you're called to be a shepherd. Watch over people, not because you must, but because you're willing. God wants you to be willing, not pursuing dishonest game, be eager to serve, not lording over those in trouble. I mean, he, and then he says, God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble, but the humility is also casting all your anxiety on Jesus. Not only are you to watch all the behavioral stuff mentioned in the first part, but a requirement is also stop hiding your stuff. Be alert, be sober. Your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Look up the context of that word. It's not just the devil. Is any adversary that will dare come against you, any adversarial situation, anything that will pull you out of the presence of God. Resist your adversary. Resist the people causing you trouble. Resist. Because you can be anxious. You can be in dire situations in your mental health. And listen, it doesn't change the fact that God is with you. It doesn't change that. The Lord wants us to be healed of our mental health issues. And this is just the first part of this teaching. He wants us to be healed. But in order to do that, we have to walk away from legalism. We have to walk away from thinking that there's only one way God can heal me. God, there's got to be a demon. I got to get the demon out. Okay. If, if you think you have that many demons, there will never be an end to it. There will never be an end. Oh my goodness. There will never be an end. We will always be looking for something. Oh, 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 God. We can't just look for things that come one way. God may need intervention through a doctor. You may need, and listen, I hope that I, I hope you guys are hearing me. If you're having trouble hearing me, let me know so that I can come out and come back in. If you can hear me, let me know. We can hear you clearly. Okay, so I want you to know that God can use any means necessary to bring you healing. Sometimes as believers, we believe he can only do it one way or a certain way, or we have this specific avenue. There could very well be demonic oppression, especially when there's been certain kinds of sin that mental health has brought us into. But I'm here to tell you that most, most of us are not battling it from that demonic perspective. It's just not. We're in a fallen world due to sin, the sin nature of the world. But we're in the kingdom. And we're sons. Your sonship doesn't cease because you're going through in your mind. It doesn't. Your sonship doesn't cease because you make a mistake. Your sonship doesn't cease. I mean, David tells that story very well, doesn't he? David testifies to the truth of grace. But in the new covenant, we have a covenant of grace. Jesus gave us a covenant of grace, not just a release of grace, but a covenant of grace. And that's required in your healing. 
So quiet. Mental health is hard to overcome when you think it's a sign that God is not with you. And I don't want anybody to believe that just because they have been going through this for 30 years, that God is not with them. The woman with the issue of blood had decades behind her problem. The man at the Bethesda pool had decades behind his problem. And whether we get healed or not in this lifetime, God is still with us. What then shall we say to the, the, these things? Is God, if God is for us, who can be against us? Either we believe that or we don't. <laughs> Psalm 42 and 8. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and his song will be with me in the night. This is David. In other words, in my depression, in my chaos, in my confusion, a prayer to the God of my life. The God of my life. The God of my life, not just the God of my salvation. The God of my life. Colossians 1.17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. God is holding you together. I want you to know that you've not fallen apart completely because God is holding you together. Colossians 1.17. She'll be right back, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Phenomenal. And so many things uh, stand out, but one, one of the things that, and, and it actually is in line with what Apostle was talking about right before um, the communication broke off. I was on a missions trip um, some years ago in the Philippines, and there was one young lady who she had a, beer, a severe cleft lip and we were believing and believing that God was going to miraculously heal her, like allow the cells and the skin to grow back right on the spot. And when he didn't do it, I'm going to tell you, I was a little upset about that because we know God can work miracles and there was an expectation. But later I found out that a doctor in the U.S. was able to do reconstructive surgery and reconstruct all of that. So she was healed in a way that was way different than what we expected. So when Apostle was talking about everybody is gonna have a different, well, God has a different way of how he might heal us. We need to just have open hands and be ready for however he wants to do that, especially in our mental health, because it's so vast. There's so many things people are going through. We can't put ourselves in a place where we're comparing how we're being healed. Just because somebody else was healed a certain way, why is there an expectation that we be healed the same way? So we just have to be open to how God wants to do what he wants to do, not what we want him to do. So amen. I just wanted to share that. I am back. And I think the, mo the message we needed, we got, I don't think I was gone longer than five minutes. Am I right? Right. Yeah, so we're good. So I hope this, I love what you were sharing because um, I'm a prophet Andrea, I love this because, um, I, you know, one of the reasons why, one the, the last straw for me getting, leaving the church, I got tired of people bringing me up. When I say leaving the church, I'm meaning, I mean the machine of the institution. I've never left the church of Jesus. One of the struggles that I had was um, my husband and I, you know, after my son was born and he had all the problems that he had, the first thing that, that they did and they meant well, please. Is there a family else in your family like your son? I was like, no. Um, they were like, well, did you and your husband do drugs? I was like, no, not while we were well, not while out, not during the pregnancy. I said, everybody's normal in my family. And they were like, well, it must be a curse. And then it was, um, 
well, God's going to heal him. And I got tired of every Sunday or every time a revival service, my son was the I was going to heal him of his intellectual disability. God was going to heal him of his other disabilities. You know, all these things. So why am I sharing, sharing this? Because we are in a place in ministry in which we have to sometimes receive people for who they are and where they are and accept Sorry for the technical difficulties. Please. Good morning, everyone. This has been a really, really incredible teaching. And um, I wrote a poem and I'm gonna title this Spiral. God, if darkness and light are the same to you, and if all things are made new, does that include my emptiness too? Yes, if all things are made new, God, does that include mental health too? Does that include the days I can't seem to get out of bed? Does your grace really cover all this chaos in my head? Where are you, God? And why is this struggle in my mind so hard? And why does the mind of Christ seem so far? If all things are made new, does that include my emptiness too? For my tears had become my food all day long. And religion said that I had to be doing something so wrong. Shame tied me up. Religion told me that I was under a curse. My mental health spiraled. All the while religion conspired to give me formulas for why I was this way and what I must have done bad today. Strange thing is, nobody paused to ask me if I was okay or to even offer grace. My relationship sank like the worst kind of ship, cold compassion and illegitimate transactions. Meanwhile, I couldn't get out of bed. Religion told me to pray more, they said. God, if all things are made new, does that include my mental health too? Yes, religion said I was doing something wrong. Christ, on the other hand, came and said, it is done. The work is finished. And before you ever struggled in your mind, the work finished the entire time. For the son of God was slain before the foundation of the world. And the crown was placed for every mental issue you face. This is not a punishment, just a part of being in a fallen world. But if you trust me in it, I'll minister to you right where it hurts. You are redeemed, so never forget it. No matter what you face, you have my presence. For the isolation and the rain, I give you my presence. For the spaces of confusion and delusion, I give you my presence. For the spaces of shame, religion, and tormenting pain, I give you my presence. And when you feel like no one understands, and when you secretly wonder, is life really worth this dance? And when your soul's so exhausted, it needs to breathe. And when your mind fights you so profoundly that it's getting harder to breathe. And just because you may battle depression and different forms of mental deserts, and just because it seems like things will never change, and that the clarity you seek brings you so much shame. And just because right now life may seem like hell instead of heaven, always remember, beloved, I've given you my presence. My presence will be enough for you, even in the darkness of your life. There, I'll be your light. And no, I haven't rescinded my promises to you. Even in the height of the mind's condition, I will still be faithful to you. Despite what religion says, I have not changed my mind about my love and call to you because of what's in your head. I, the Lord, give you compassion. And for the times the clarity you seek brought so much shame, just know that my grace is still actively working in your life in Jesus' name. This simple trust will set you free. 
I only have one question for you. Do you believe? Even in inescapable mental anguish, I am committed to ministering to your needs. I am beyond your mind, beloved, communing with your spirit before time. So you asked me if all things are made new, does that include my emptiness too? And the Lord continued to respond, I cannot promise you it won't hurt, but I can promise you that I will be with you in the dark. And your mental health does not make you any less. And it does not mean that you failed some type of sick legalistic religious test. Your mental health has never disqualified you. Despite what religion told you, God still loves you. He loves you just the same. And you are not spiritually deficient because you experience this type of insurmountable mental pain. Healing has been redefined. Somehow in this process, I gain new eyes. Christ in me, the hope of glory. And the true overcoming simply means that God is with me in this journey. Amen. Woo. Praise God. 